Colin Sutherland, as he was then known, was called to the Scottish Bar in 1977 and was made a Queen's Counsel in 1990. That was shortly after a spell as an advocate deputy. Part of the work of the Lord Justice Clerk is to lead on sentencing and sentencing considerations. So we will be especially interested to hear what Lord Carloway has to say. The title of his lecture is Sentencing Beyond Punishment and Deterrence. Lord Carloway. Thank you, Lord Cullum. I would like at the outset to thank Sacro for affording me this opportunity to express what will be essentially some personal views on the broad topic of sentencing beyond retribution and deterrence. The topic has too many aspects to cover in a short talk such as this. There are some extremely important areas which I am not going to touch upon specifically, notably the matter which Lord Cullen has just referred to, which is the effect of sentencing on children, the treatment of women offenders, mental health disposals, and the place of victims in the current sentencing process. These are all extremely important areas requiring separate treatment and a separate talk. What I'm hoping to do this evening and I hope this will not be a disappointment to those of you who I know have expert in these particular areas. What I hope to do is to provide some insight into judicial thinking about how sentencing operates in practice at present and how it might operate differently in the future. That phraseology perhaps gives you some indication that there is as ever room for improvement in that thinking. That improvement on the part of the judiciary may be in relation not only to the proper approach to sentencing, both in general and in specific cases, but also in this age of mass media, in the expression of sentencing in the public forum. Can I start with a word of caution, which I'm sure will be appreciated uh, by the criminologists amongst you. And I derived this from a recent book review, which I was reading. And it's, the, the book review said this, and I quote, Sometimes it feels as though criminologists and lawyers occupy different worlds. Lawyers shut their eyes to be what can be learned from criminologists. The lawyer's comfort zone, and I'll return to the comfort zone quite soon, the lawyer's comfort zone is to be found in the law, rules, and maybe the interpretation of policy documents. Criminal lawyers and judges need to understand what is known about the causes of crime and what works to reduce it. Criminologists should take some of the blame, often writing in a language with a vocabulary which alienates the outsider." Close quotes. There is then a significant divergence in the use of language between the lawyer, perhaps in particular the judge, and the criminologists, and those in other disciplines including social and other support workers connected with the criminal justice system. Yet it is imperative that there be mutual understanding of each other's thinking. And that is partly why I focus on judicial thinking in this talk. But by way of introduction, and to put what I'm going to say into some kind of historical context, I refer first of all to a case which affected this building, or originated rather from this building, some 70 years ago. On the 26th of January, 1944, four students from Edinburgh University got together to clandestinely remove typewriters from the secretarial department of Old College. Two of them were that the protagonists who actually went into the office removed the typewriters, took them up onto the roof and then lowered them down to their two colleagues who stood waiting below. All four were aged 17 and 18 and all had, and I again quote, good characters and came from good homes and from excellent schools. That is perhaps actually, if one researches the matter a little 
deeply, uh, more deeply, an understatement. They all appeared uh, in the Sheriff Court on the 3rd of February. All four pled guilty and each was promptly sentenced by the Sheriff to three weeks imprisonment without, as was then, it was then put, the option of a fine. The Lord Justice General Normand, who heard the appeal which was held within a matter of two or three weeks afterwards, remarked upon the parentage of the students, their homes and their schools, as, involved, as involving double-edged considerations. Ultimately, the two main players were shown no mercy and the sentences of three weeks in prison stood. The other two were fortunate and made the subject of probation orders. Now, I mention that case not just because of its physical proximity, but to see the direction of the route to justice in sentencing over which the courts have travelled since that time. So what I would like to do this evening is to pick up one or two of the threads which were left dangling from that type of case and disposal in wartime and to examine the extent to which sentencing has progressed since then uh, and the manner in which we might progress further in the coming years. Can I start then with a look at the traditional approach to sentencing as seen by the courts? The court requires to sentence the offender. It's important to notice that the word is sentence, not punish. Just what a particular judge is doing when he is carrying out that exercise ought to depend, to a material degree, it might be thought, on what he or she considers the exercise of sentencing is designed to achieve. It is not an essential element of a law degree nor a requirement to qualify as a solicitor or an advocate that a course in criminology or social work be undertaken. Equally, since neither the solicitor nor the advocate is called upon to undertake the task of sentencing during his professional career, it does not form part of the necessary knowledge or experience required for the appointment of a new sheriff or judge. He or she may have a background of attending sentencing diets in solemn or summary cases, but not necessarily so, and to have done that is not a compulsory, a compulsory element in the appointment process. Hopefully, all High Court and Sheriff Court sentencers will be familiar from their knowledge of philosophy with the traditional theories describing how justice is achieved in the sentencing process and from which we derive the principles of punishment. I'm not going to maintain the philosophical aspect for very long, but if we focus on that for just a minute or two and start from the abstract thinking, if we start from Professor Hart's prologue to the principles of punishment, most will be aware, on the one hand, of the retributivist school. That's a word I'm not going to repeat because I find it extremely difficult. <laughs> Following on the works of Kant and Hegel, and that seeks to impose upon the offender, quotes, his just deserts. That is to say that the punishment should fit the crime. Now, th these two words, just deserts, as you will know, actually figured in the Conservative government's white paper, which preceded the Criminal Justice Act 1991 for England and Wales, and they were repeated by the then Lord Chancellor in his foreword to the Ministry of Justice's breaking the cycle policy as one of the two fundamentals along with public safety which a state should offer its citizens. So there is the one school that the offender should receive his, quotes, just deserts. Many of a more liberal persuasion, on the other hand, will seek to follow the utilitarian school, the works, uh, the teachings of Bentham and Mill, which has at its heart the idea of social protection achieved by means of preventing the particular offender from committing further crimes and, at the same time, of deterring others. And this, of course, holds that punishment in an individual case should benefit society as a whole. It may have, as part of it, the, the object of rehabilitating the offender, 
as well as his incarceration. So these are the two schools which one would expect the sheriff and the judge to be aware of from their academic career. And the schools, although they proffer different ideas, they are not entirely inconsistent. In the modern era, retribution and deterrence, which remain key elements from each school, remain central pillars in the theory of judicial thinking on sentencing. Both elements, you may recall, feature in the 2003 legislation concerning the introduction of the punishment part as a requirement of a life sentence. And I'll return to punishment parts too later <coughs> on. The third element in the sentencing process in that legislation, and which the court was told not to take into account when fixing the punishment part, was protection of the public. Now, on this basis, it would seem that the Parliament has determined that, at least in custodial sentences, but perhaps generally also, there are three principal components in a sentence. Retribution, deterrence, and protection of the public. However, the extent to which the Scottish courts have actually expressed retribution, deterrence, or protection of the public as critical elements in the sentencing process in a given case is limited. The difficulty which the judges faced in fixing punishment parts using this particular methodology of compartmentalizing elements of a sentence was that none, I suspect, had hitherto thought in terms of breaking a sentence down into specific periods for specific elements. Digressing slightly, it's not unreasonable to say that the judiciary had considerable difficulty in understanding what was required when selecting punishment parts for mandatory life sentences and for what are now the orders for lifelong restriction, again, to which I'll return. The Act of 2012 is designed to cure any problems of interpretation which have arisen from judicial decision-making, but unless one has a clear understanding of the background of the new legislation and its intent, the courts may not be entirely out of the statutory woods in that area. Let me go back to the comfort zone, the comfort zone of the lawyer. Assuming that the, the, that the sheriff and the judge has a good grasp, uh, gr grasp of abstract theory, and returning to the quotation about the use of language which I started with, how then is the understanding of theory put into practice by the judge or the sheriff? How does it fit into his or her comfort zone? It is interesting to note that the main current legal textbook on sentencing, which is used on a day-to-day -day basis, expressly declines to deal with general principles of this magnitude at all. Now, that's not an omission from the book. It's a deliberate editorial choice. Now, that is understandable for a legal textbook. And the same approach to sentencing is adopted by the main volumes on criminal procedure, available on the bench of any sheriff or judge. The lawyer's comfort zone is in the law, the rules. In the ordinary case, the judge, and particularly the sheriff, will not be so much interested in the objectives of sentencing, in an abstract or even a real sense, but simply in first, what the maximum or minimum component of the sentence is, and secondly, what the norm for the particular offence for someone with the accused's background happens to be. The function of the first instance court, the sentencing court, is then generally a practical one of applying the law at its raw end, but not to invent or to cont contemplate theoretical ideals. This is ultimately why the sentencing textbook, which in its least loose leaf form extends to more than 1,000 pages and increasing, is regarded by the lawyer as so helpful in a practical sense, because within it can be found the many relatively recent precedents shortly stated. It is an encyclopedia of examples of what has gone before. Since all the cases are at appellate level, it might be thought 
that it should promote consistency in the penalties selected. However, in using examples in this way to ground sentencing decisions, the assumption must be that the elements of retribution, deterrence and public protection have already been taken into account in the earlier determinations and that there is no need to reconsider them in the particular case. They are integral to the precedents. That then is the principal understanding of the sentencing court, which will be reluctant to depart from the recognised levels of penalty except in wholly exceptional circumstances. There is, after all, little purpose in the first instance court developing a jurisprudence of its own if, it's that, if that is not one which is consistent with decisions at appellate level. The sentencing textbook then does not go behind the decisions in order to define or explain what sentences are designed to achieve. Its predecessor did examine the objectives and principles involved in sentencing up to a point. It expressed what may seem, at least on a cursory glance, and but for what I've just touched upon, perhaps an obvious view, that the sentencing judge, quote, must, although he may not think of it in every case, decide what his sentencing objectives are, both in general and in relation to the particular case. This, however, begs the question of the degree to which the individual judges, and again particularly the sheriffs, do indeed, or ought to, think about sentencing objectives in a general sense, as distinct from applying what are recognised to be acceptable levels of penalty, which the appellate courts have already determined to be generally appropriate for the particular level of offending. The book identified a problem in the search for objectives in reported judgments, of what, of, because of what the author perceived, no doubt correctly, to be the custom of the criminal appellate courts, to say no more in a particular case than was necessary for its disposal. The High Court, sitting in its appellate capacity, tended, and again I quote, to decide cases on their own facts and circumstances rather than on the basis of any declared principles. This was a notable contrast, the author observed, with most of the other countries in the Commonwealth, notably England, New Zealand and Canada. The author of that book, who was an experienced sheriff and latterly sheriff principal, was able to express certain general views under subheadings, which he said encapsulated the objectives of sentencing within the Scottish system. Deterrence, punishment, protection of the public, denunciation, rehabilitation, restitution, economy, and reduction of crime. No quotation, however, from any decided case was cited which expressed the view that any of these objectives actually formed part of the court's reasoning in justifying a particular disposal. The traditional approach then of saying no more than is necessary to deal with the particular facts and circumstances, and perhaps also discouraging the use of precedence in sentencing, is regarded by some as laudable. However, as I've said in relation to other topics, although a legal system ought to be careful to guard what is good in its traditions, built as they are upon the wisdom of generations, if the essentials are out of kilter with the fundamentals applied in all other similar civilised systems, it will often be time to look again at the domestic regime with a heavier degree of scrutiny. Scotland does not have a statement of pr principles of a general nature enshrined in law. England does. Are the English provisions glimpses of the blindingly obvious, which do not require expression in statutory or other form? Should we be looking to England in the first place or to smaller jurisdictions similar to our own? This is something requiring further analysis. Nevertheless, if the stated principles which I've just mentioned are not mere rhetoric, and if the courts are to have regard to, for example, the need to reduce crime through deterrence, or to the reform and rehabilitation of offenders, returning to the quotation about language, the courts have to know, amongst other critical matters, what demonstrably operates as a deterrent, 
what has been shown to rehabilitate effectively, and what val values should be put on each element in a given case. Put another way, we need to understand each other's thinking. A separate topic which I wish to touch upon is the effect of public opinion. It is perhaps only since the 1970s that there's been real focus on sentencing theory and practice. Before then, sentencing might have been described as an approximate balance of brutality and paternalism, not necessarily in that order. At the High Court level, almost all sentences were measured in periods of years above the statutory maximum for the sheriff court of, of two years imprisonment at that time. And that remains, with some notable exceptions, the situation today, with an adjustment for the number of years to five. And that is given the normal level of seriousness of crimes prosecuted in the High Court. It accords with public expectations of the use of significant retributive of justice for high-level offending. If there is to be general respect for the law, and in particular the criminal justice system, the public must regard sentencing as legitimate. That is to say, it must in general be in tune with common shared societal values. There requires then to be an independent assessment by the judge of the sentence in the particular crime. But that assessment is not to be carried out in a vacuum into which only that judge's or sheriff's personal values or morality are poured. The judicial function remains to carry out the requirements of society to determine what is appropriate and proportionate. That task ought to be carried out not as a consequence of instinctive reaction, but by applying recognised principles and practices of the law as set out in statute and precedent. It is also undertaking, keeping in mind what will or will not be regarded as acceptable, not just to the appellate court, but in the public forum. Public opinion then, insofar as it can be accurately ascertained, is important. This is not a reference to the headlines in the popular press, but to properly researched material, which does exist, of the public's understanding of the court's performance in sentencing offenders. If sentencing decisions do not generally accord with public perception of what just punishment is, respect for and the value of the sentencing process will deteriorate. And this is a danger which must be noticed and guarded if confidence in the system is to be preserved. Judges and sheriffs have to be aware of the potential for unjust sentences as the public might perceive them, not simply to affect the offender for good or ill, but also to undermine public attitudes to the legal system. It is in the area of the sentencing arena, however, that the discretionary powers of the judge or sheriff come under attack, notably from the popular press, but sometimes from the more responsible elements in the media too. There is, of course, no difficulty in the public criticism of sentencing decisions as a generality, provided matters are not allowed to spiral out of control. There has to be a recognition on all sides, including politicians and members of the Fourth Estate, however, of the potential effects of repeated vitriolic attacks on sentencing decisions. In one particularly disturbing case, when the judge's family home had been targeted and one particular paper ran a reader's poll to promote the judge's removal for off from office, the court was keen to stress that, and again I quote, the denigration of a judge betrays gross indifference to the critical importance in a democratic society of the independence of the judiciary and tends to, tends to harm the administration of justice. If a judge's reputation or tenure of office were to depend on whether his decisions met with popular approval, nothing could be more calculated to undermine public confidence in the judiciary and put at hazard the integrity and independent judgment which the public expect of judges. That is one side of the equation. There is little doubt that press attacks, if sustained, will have an effect on sentencing and perhaps also on parole board decision making. If popular and political culture were to be focused on the just desserts policy, 
which some say is increasing in, uh, increasingly the case in European society, where almost all imprisonment levels are on the increase, jail sentences will become more frequent and longer, and in essence, injustice will prevail. A particular problem can be seen in, and I return to, the selection of punishment parts in murder cases. The court is, of course, imposing a life sentence. That is what it's doing and is determining the minimum period to be served before parole can be considered. This was, uh, it will be recalled, a, a decision which was made by the legislature in response to human rights concerns about indeterminate sentences. But as sometimes occurs, there are unintended consequences of good deeds, none of which, it is also said, go unpunished. The court began this new era by selecting relatively modest periods for punishment parts, since the judges well understood that these periods were minima. And after all, in the past, there had previously been no periods at all, and the parole board could, and sometimes did, that release life prisoners when they had served relatively short periods of incarceration. There was a perception that offenders might be released after 10 years or more in the public arena. That was true of 1986, although it had increased by some 30 to 13 only 10 years later, and is now probably established at 15 or more. When the punishment part was introduced, albeit that this was plainly... Uh, the, 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 when the punishment part was introduced, the press regularly reported the minimum as being the sentence, even although it was plainly not the case since that period did not take into account the very factor which the public might have been most interested in, namely their own protection. A culture of retribution, then, is not what society ought to be aiming at as a generality, even if the retributive element can take the front stage par excellence for extremely serious cases, such as the murder of multiple victims. The exemplary sentence does have its place, However, as has been said elsewhere, a prevailing dynamic of retribution across the board restrains the proper use of discretion. What ought to be being considered then is a move away from this type of approach, which is designed to stigmatise the offender and to subjugate and isolate him from society, to a model in which sentences are far more tailored to the individual sentence, to the individual offender, and are more inclusive to taking account of the needs of the community including those of the victim in which the offender has operated and to which he may return. However, every sound idea brings with it its different problems. Embarking without significant research on such a model may promote the legitimate concern of the current system that sentencing can be unduly inconsistent. It may also rem uh, remain impossible to persuade the public that anything short of imprisonment is not punishment. Rehabilitation, I know of particular concern to many of you. How is that fitting in with the judicial mindset in the modern era? The notion that the convicted person may be rehabilitated is not new, if that is by, by that is meant a correctional mode of that particular approach. Diagnosis of problem followed by treatment, drugs and alcohol pro uh, problems, etc., the relational model, the fact that uh, the offender will require to be re reintegrated into his, or at least a community, uh, can be looked upon and efforts can be made, as, and as are by this organisation in particular, to provide him with employment, accommodation and general planning, lifestyle advice. It's necessary then to return to the question of whether judges and sheriffs should have either of these models in mind when dealing with a particular offender. Returning to the position in the High Court with which I'm uh, particularly familiar, the first and perhaps most significant area where we take into account the effect of rehabilitation is within the context of the order for lifelong restriction. Now, these have been competent now for about seven years, but the circumstances in which they may be regarded uh, as appropriate 
and proportionate may still require some degree of analysis. They are competent, indeed theoretically mandatory, if an offender has a, quotes, propensity to commit, close quotes, sexual or violent offences, and it is demonstrated that there is a likelihood that he, if at liberty, will seriously endanger the lives or physical or psychological well-being of members of the public at large. It was envisaged, I think, in the McLean report, which dealt with this matter and recommended the order for lifelong restriction, that the type of order of that, that type of order would only be imposed in rare cases, but they have been used in relation to what in themselves might have been regarded as relatively minor offences. The problem which the judges have faced stems from the similarity between the test for imposing an order for lifelong restriction and that for an extended sentence, which are quite similar in their phraseology. In imposing a custodial sentence, whether an OLR, an extended sentence, or otherwise, the court does not, indeed cannot, specify the measures of rehabilitation which should be put in place. The direction of corrective measures is left primarily to the prison authorities and to the local programmes which exist, and, of course, notably the offender's willingness to reform. Relational measures are left to such post-custodial regimes as might be put in place by the local authority, social work and other departments. This, of course, is in contrast to the use of supervised release orders where the court does, or at least can, suggest conditions to promote rehabilitation. It's possible, then, to see the extended sentence as essentially retributive in nature, but the SRO as primarily deterrent in the utilitarian sense, although aspects of each may be present with both. The community payback order. Returning then to where this talk began, with the students and their typewriters, one critical improvement which has been made over the last few decades is the reduction in the imposition of short-term custodial sentences. It is, of course, widely known that the vast majority of crimes, especially violent crimes, are committed by young males between 16 and 25. It was and may ever be thus for physiological and other maturity type reasons. One message, however, which both the Parliament and the High Court have tried and I hope broadly now succeeded in putting across to sentencers is that offenders, especially young and first offenders, should not be imprisoned or detained unless no other method of dealing with him or her is appropriate. There is now, of course, the prohibition on sentences of less than three months. This is all very laudable and is designed to end the revolving prison door form of justice. It has been said for years that short sentences do not work and are probably counterproductive. The drive by the courts away from the retributive justice model in sentencing is best illustrated by a particular case. This was a 16-year-old who robbed a 14-year-old paper boy by presenting a knife at him. No physical injury was inflicted. The, 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 the boy who uh, offended, had a minor record, was from a broken home, and had developed into an alcoholic at a remarkably young age. The sheriff sentenced him to three years' detention, and he reported in the following terms to the High Court. I have to have regard, however, to the interests of decent people in society who are entitled to expect that if someone robs another person at knife point, then that person will be imprisoned for a substantial period, both as a punishment and as a deterrent to others. To do otherwise would to be to send out a weak and unconscionable message to society. This is, of course, the kind of outspoken and exaggerated remark which is likely to alienate the appeal court, which does attempt to approach sentencing of offenders in a calm, reasoned and impartial manner. The then Lord Justice Clark, Lord Gill, uh, accepted that re re retribution and deterrence were important factors in the sentencing process, but retorted with the now classic lines, 
But there is more to sentencing than sending messages to society, particularly in the case of the young offender. The court has to consider the personal circumstances of such an offender, his home background, the extent to which he may or may not be solely responsible for his behavioural problems, and the opportunities that a non-custodial sentence may give for rehabilitation before he becomes trapped in a cycle of crime. The case could not be clearer in its message, and it has been followed repeatedly in High Court appellate decisions since then in, in, in relation to first young and minor offenders. It is important, of course, to re-emphasise the need for the judge or the sheriff to remain independent of government when sentencing an individual offender. That's part of the, his essential uh, uh, position in society. That does not mean that the judge or the sheriff becomes the personal friend of the accused. Nor does it mean that the judge or sheriff should be unaware of what is going around him or her in society in general. It remains extremely important for the judges and sheriffs to be aware of what is happening in our communities. The judge or sheriff may, for, for obvious reasons, often does, live in a relatively protected environment where the incidence of crime is low. However, it must not be forgotten that it is generally in the less wealthy and more deprived areas that honest citizens have to put up with repeated violence and threats, muggings and burglaries, and I'm now quoting again, graffiti and needles on their doorsteps. The courts do then have an important role to play in at least not undermining the drives which the government and others have promulgated with a view to making our community safer by reducing the incidence of crime. Neither the courts, nor the government, nor the legislature, nor anyone else is likely to succeed in that goal unless there is a degree of dovetailing of the ideas and methods employed by each other. That means that each organ of the state, and I return to the use of language, has to be aware of what the other is doing, why it is doing it, and what success has been achieved. The principle of the independence of the judiciary does not carry with it the obligation, as I've said, to befriend the offender at the expense of the community. The judge or sheriff, of course, ought to have an interest in the task which he or she is carrying out. He or she, however, must keep his distance from the offender and act dispassionately according to the accepted norms. Nevertheless, there is an opportunity with the flexibility of the CPO to have much more joined up thinking in the sentencing process. The Criminal Justice Social Work Report should include details of the possible requirements which might be imposed. The reasons for any suggestions in that report ought to be apparent. And rather than the judges looking to find fault in such reports, as of course has happened in the past, they ought to be attempting to find the most effective solution once the principle of the appropriateness of the CPO has been established. The court has had clear pointers from the legislature, from the Scottish Parliament, on what it can do with a CPO. The requirements in the one sentence can be retributive, deterrent, rehabilitative, or restorative. A tailored approach then may introduce aspects of all these elements into a single order. With the CPO then, there is an opportunity. The sentencing process is currently moving rapidly away from the short, sharp shock of periods of incarceration in favour of the community-based disposal. Now, that's no doubt a good thing. There are three concerns. The first is that the court, that is the, the sheriff in particular, has had sufficient time to carry out a proper tailoring exercise required by the C in a CPO. The second is that there are sufficient resources in the system to ensure that the requirements are properly monitored. And the third is to ensure that there are in place effective measures to deal with those defaulting from the terms of the order. It is in this particular area, although no doubt others, that I admit to a particular lack of practical knowledge. How can the courts deal satisfactorily with the offender who is unwilling or simply incapable of complying with a CPO?
especially where the CPO has followed up failure to pay a fine? How is the recalcitrant recidivist to be dealt with without putting him in prison? This is something which I would welcome your views on. It is said that the prison population will rise to around 8,300 in the coming in this year and to as much as 9,500 by the year 2020. This is despite the measures which have already been taken to prevent this trend continuing. There is much to be done to tackle that problem. One thing is for sure, a system which is based on populist retribution will not achieve it. I end with reference to the Sentencing Council. It would be churlish to end otherwise, given uh, that it is the Lord Justice Clark who is uh, designated to chair that body once it is up and running. The Sentencing Council was promoted in an Act of 2010, following upon the recommendations in the final report of the Sentencing Commission in 2006. It has not been established because of the current constraints on government spending, but its objectives when it is set up will be to promote consistency in sentencing practice, to assist the development of policy in sentencing, to promote greater awareness and understanding of sentencing policy and practice. It will prepare for approval of the court sentencing guidelines which may relate to the principles and purposes of sentencing, sentencing levels, particular types of sentence for particular types of offence or offender and the circumstances in which guidelines may be departed from. The Council has to consult before submitting any guidelines. However, once approved, the Court will be obliged to have regard to these guidelines. Apart from the Chairman of the Lord Justice Clark, there are to be four judicial office holders on the Council three lawyers, policemen, expert in victims, uh, uh, in victims, and one other lay person. As is not unusual when reform of, uh, reforms to the law are being promoted, the idea of promulgating guidelines, even if they require court approval, has its critics, mostly those who, for reasons which escape me, prefer a more haphazard and inconsistent approach with no defined principles. I have little doubt that once the Council is established, it will take Scotland into a new era of sentencing, one which will attempt to create a more principled approach and will define, upon the basis of concrete research, what we are trying to achieve and how it can be achieved. It will not eradicate crime, but it will advance Scotland into a more civilised era, era where retribution other than in relation to the most serious of crimes, will have a much smaller plate at the sentencing table. Thank you. As is uh, custom here, I offer my thanks to you, Lord Galloway, for the contribution you've made tonight and ask everyone to join me in showing our sincere and deep appreciation of that. Thanks very much.